Welcome in from your SUV, from your tractor or your ute, or maybe you're even riding your electric motorbike. But from wherever you are, you're with Alistair Moorhead and Glenn Judson, and this is The Alan Juddy Show. Well, what we want to do is reach out and provide you some technical information on a range of agricultural topics which may interest you. But to do it in a different way. Casual and comfortable format that allows you to listen where you want and when you want. This is intended for general information, and for more specific advice, contact your local Agricom rep. In this particular episode, Alistair, what are we going to be talking about? Well, Glenn, we're going to be discussing red clover and all of its characteristics and its roles in New Zealand agriculture. So on the agenda today, uh, we are going to look at uh, what is red clover and the types and the styles it may come from. Uh, we're going to discuss its special powers as far as it being a legume, uh, cover off uh, uh, how we came about the genetics we have today in Agricom's portfolio, uh, discuss animal performance and animal-related topics. Oh, I look forward to Yeah, I know you are. Just settle down there, animal man. Uh, and uh, looking at uh, uh, some of the animal health things, which with Dr. Death in the room, that's always useful, uh, and cover off the pests, the, some of the pests of it, and finish with how does the red clover fit in your farm system. Yeah, and that'll be really important to see how we can fit red clover into a farm system and get the best use out of it. <laughs> So, um, Alistair, tell me a little bit about red clover. What is actually red clover as a, as a species? Well, Juddy, uh, red clover is trifolium pretense. It's a taprooted plant that has uh, predominantly a stem habit. It's a bunched habit in its growth, but when it goes reproductive, it forms stems. And what that basically means are pastoral environments where you make hay and silage. And it's really in the New Zealand landscape where we graze our pastures that uh, red clover has developed into a, a predominantly a grazing plant as opposed to a silage or hay type species uh, it's quite a shy cedar it requires long tongue bumble peas to uh, pollinate and so seed production off red is actually quite an art form and it does require that that insect as a primary uh, pollinator and it's got it's defined by being called red clover but it's got quite large um, flowers that sort of go from pink almost to a purpley red but with some sets of genetics, you can even find the odd white, um, larger white flower too, which won't be confused with white clover. Uh, the primary types I've already touched on is that you tend to find there is upright hay and silage types, so they can be quite stemmy through the reproductive phase. And then you've got a group that particularly has uh, been evolved in New Zealand's uh, plant breeding history that are associated with grazing and, and forming a more bunched habit. And you tend to find these types revert back from stem elongation back to a bunched habit very quickly under grazing. So so um, uh, let's say I'm in the paddock and and um, I've got some clover and I want to identify um, you know, whether it's red clover or um, potentially white. So so one of them obviously is the flower colour. So that's, um, what, what, uh, is there something simple that we could look at to see whether um, we had a white clover or a red clover? Absolutely. Uh, probably fits best uh, through autumn and early spring and winter where you might have dewy mornings. Uh, what you will see very clearly is any dew droplets in your pasture will be holding to the leaves of red clover and not white and that's because red clover is hairy so it's got uh, fine hairs all over its leaves and its stem and you tend to find it catches the moisture and white clover is hairless which basically means the water you know runs off it very successfully so it's one of the wee telltale signs in the in the that time here hairy leaves hairy plants versus uh, clean, hairless plant. And so um, with red clover, I guess um, uh, really important to try and understand the seasonal growth uh, patterns of that in a, in, a, in, a, in a pasture. Can you describe to me a little bit about um, what that what those um, seasonal growth habits are? When, when, when are we going to see it and when does it um, become more dormant? Yeah, so when we're dealing with a legume, you tend to find the temperature driven. Uh, plants with bigger tap roots have abilities to get going they've got more reserves to get going um, on the shoulders of the season at times but in general terms they're not particularly winter active compared to grass species so you'd seem with our reds today particularly our earlier flowering reds they tend to activate pretty uh, intensively in September and they peak in their 
quite overwhelming growth actually by November. Uh, they have strengths in summer and all, early autumn because again they are going through the reproductive phase there and they're tap rooted and they carry their own nitrogen so they're quite active around the hotter and partially drier time of year. So red clover's got a, a classical habit of peaking in November and being quite a strong performer relative to other species through summer and early autumn. Yeah, actually, um, an interesting uh, fact about red clover is that um, it's actually a plant that's used in some human health supplements. So it's actually got a range of secondary plant, plant compounds that are actually really useful from a from a human health point of view. So it's it's not just a necessarily just a forage. It's actually got some some um, some other attributes. And I guess the other the other point, and we'll cover this a little bit later in terms of um, because of the ability for it to grow quite large amounts um, and and be um, certainly high quality. Um, we do find that we get improved animal performance, particularly growth, um, when we've got this in our, in our pastures. So it's a, it's, a, it's a very useful thing to have um, in, in, in pastures. Um, uh, we've talked about the difference between red clover and, and, and white clover um, a little bit. Um, um, do we have any, um, does red clover spread at all? Um, uh, what's, what's the relationship between the amount that we sow and the amount that we get in a pasture over time? So the key to red clover, it's quite a large seed and it's probably bordering on close uh, twice the size of a white clover seed so you have one seed one plant and with white clover it's a clonally spreading plant with horizontal stems called stolons and uh, that means that as the root structure the primary root structure breaks down a white clover after about 18 months it starts to fragment off in those on those stolons and they are rooted to the ground and it can actually clonally move across pasture. With red clover, it is a one seed, one plant uh, a species, which basically means it's not vegetatively spreading. Uh, there's small traits and different genetics found uh, that may suggest you might be able to have a little tiny bit of uh, lateral um, spread, but relative to white clover it's insignificant and it is very much one seed, one plant, one taproot, one space, it's not forever moving. The only way it moves in your pasture is if you let it go through to a full seed set, which pasture is quite advanced and hayed off would be the best description and then you might get spread by seed quite successfully but by then you've definitely let your pasture go lost the quality creating a hay-like uh, product. Excellent. And, and so um, I guess one of the benefits, apart from um, it as a forage, um, it does, it, being a legume, it fixes nitrogen. And, and so um, give me a little bit of a flavour of when we talk about it fixes nitrogen. Give me a, um, a, a brief description of what actually that means. Well, we've there's a series of uh, rules pretty much about the efficiency of some of these primary pasture legumes for nitrogen fixation and the, the fundamental rule that, that applies to white clover actually does appear to be applying to red as well and that it converts atmospheric nitrogen through uh, rhizobia in a symbiotic relationship to feed the plant um, uh, nitrogen and that nitrogen is cycled through the plant into the animal and from the animal into meat and milk um, and the the leftover is then urinated out and creating the nitrogen cycle based on the legume through the animal to the ground uh, um, cycle. That ratio is in the bounds of about 28 grams per kg of dry matter, which is very, very similar to white clover. The efficiencies are very similar. There's a bit of literature that varies between Europe and, and probably what we're experiencing here in New Zealand, but uh, it is fixing nitrogen at a pretty consistent rate. The other element is the the breaking down of root structures and uh, nodules off the roots underground which is another pool of nutrient that's been created by these legumes and what we have seen with our genetics is that as we're breaking that uh, primary taproot uh, driver with which, which I think we're doing in the breeding world when we're breeding for grazing resilience we're tending to um, break that dependency on a single storage part of the plant which is a taproot and creating a lot of laterals and these laterals are spreading the root structure across the surface under under the soil more and that means that when the root hairs and the nodules break down it's spreading nitrogen around itself quite uh, generously is what I would describe with red clover. So um, 
rear clover's taking atmospheric nitrogen, of which what we breathe is about 78%, um, and it's it's um, taking that nitrogen and it's incorporating it um, into the plant, and therefore that's the that's the start of the cycle when we're um, uh, either through the animal or um, death of the um, the those parts of the plant that um, die annually. Um, we're getting that um, cycling of, of nutrient, and it seems to be um, that. Uh, this plant is very generous with its nitrogen. There are some other legumes where um, that cycling is not nearly as high, and so red clover is one of those things that um, you will see um, benefits to the companion grasses, for example, by having high rates of um, of, of red clover. Um, what are the uh, in, in terms of the pests? You know, in terms of what what um, are the the things? Um, you know, pr- probably pr- apart from the grazing animal um, that are likely to to um, uh, damage um, uh, red clover. Well, for starters, the big uh, pasture pest in New Zealand for legumes is clover root weevil, which is a small weevil that was successfully colonised in New Zealand, and it uh, has a... Does it eat the roots? Yeah, it does. Is that why it's called clover root weevil? Yes, but yeah, it only the larvae right. eat the roots, the adult eats the, the leaves, and, and creates not uh, creates notches in the leaves. However, the, the key driver there is that... Uh, the adult has to be happy with what it's eating to then lay eggs in the ground and, and that the larvae shed the root, um, shear off all the root hairs and the nodules and put a lot of pressure on the survival of, of the legume. The key here to red clover is that it's actually quite tolerant of that particular legume pest and partly because it's got a hairy leaf and that de- appears to um, detract the adults from hanging around and staying unless it's the only legume left in a pasture, in which case the adults will still shred it. Um, But once the larvae are in the ground, they will eat the root hairs of red clover and they will eat the nodules off. But the difference between it and other legumes, they're quite a big mass and these larvae are very small, so they can't damage the roots to the same degree they can a white clover or other legumes once they're underground. When we're looking at the real pests, though... um, as from a perenniality perspective, a grass scrub, a New Zealand native grass scrub, would without doubt be one of the larger pests of red clover. However, red clover can tolerate it to a high degree, again, because it's got a large root mass underground. But the reality is uh, a grass scrub is a large larvae and it's actually eating a lot and damaging a lot of the underground amount. So although many uh, red clover plants can tolerate uh, grass scrub, a feeding, if it gets quite wet after a large feeding event, there's a lot of damage to roots underground and therefore you can get diseases, secondary plant diseases coming into the damage points and you tend to find they are very, very slow to recover if they survive and don't get secondary plant diseases and then and collapse. If they survive, you tend to find they're very slow as they're reforming all those root hairs and root mass. So grass scrub's pretty devastating. Uh, we do see a bit of feeding from uh, Perina, which is a, a widespread caterpillar um, found as a pasture pest in, in New Zealand pastures. It's a it's a brown moth that flies in November through to probably about February. And um, they're the ones hit the windows. They're the ones your cats go nuts on. Yep. And uh, once those are flying, you'll end up with large caterpillars probably within about five months that are quite active in your pasture. And uh, the other primary pest is during an establishment phase with red, and that's uh, slugs. So... Um, it's very, they are very much a, a targeter of a legumes. Uh, they will also obviously feed very heavily on all, all, past, all establishing pasture species, but they do target legumes. So slugs are a real issue for uh, establishing legumes, including red clover. And, and are they more prevalent in wet conditions? Yeah, they are, and drip drill. Uh, so once you uh, maintain a lot of material on top of the surface, depending on how much residual you have uh, in your process and how much residual you've left and how much you are drip drilling through, through uh, would define the risk of slug uh, problems but definitely humid wet conditions with a large amount of residual puts a lot of pressure on establishing legumes. Actually I've got a um, I've got a racing snail you might be interested in this I've got a racing snail and I actually took the shell off the racing snail to see if it would go faster it just made it sluggish. Oh Jody, please. That's a shocker. It's in, so, we, so we should move on. We shouldn't should we? move on yes. very quickly. So um, uh, let's talk about the um, the the um, where um, Agricom's cultivar um, relish has come from, um, because um, because of its breeding and, and the way it's been developed, it's it's, a, it's slightly different to a lot of the traditional reds. So so um, w- what's the breeding behind uh, relish? 
Well, as you pointed out, Relish is our, our current uh, uh, flagship red clover product, but uh, our heritage has come through two long-term products in New Zealand called Colenso and a more recent time, Sensation. All of these products were bred out of the Ag Research Breeding Program, which is really comprehensive. And uh, our red clover had been sitting in that breeding program for a very long time and in the late 90s, early 2000s, a very, very large and diverse genetic uh, pool of red clovers was evaluated and uh, they were extensively evaluated and through bringing some of that genetics together, uh, Relish as a, a breeding line was created. Now that program is very, very focused on survival of red clover, which has always been a questionable Point, and one that I didn't cover at the start is, is red clover in the world as a hay and silage type product is almost anything from a two to three cut product to one year to 18 months as far as survival goes without so quite, receding. So quite a short lived Correct. Um, plant. Particularly the types designed for subtropical zones and areas where you're focused on hay and silage production. And I guess that's where we sometimes we get the comments saying I really love red clover but it doesn't last. Correct. Correct. So when we stabilised around uh, the diploid style of red clover that is most commonly used, partly because of its uh, more successful seed production, but also because they tend to be quite resilient and more t- more tillered, basically. They form a bigger bunch, which is more tolerant of grazing. We've really formed these grazing styles, and uh, it is really an important part of that ag research development program was the success of... Uh, uh, about over 100 genotypes or accessions of red clover being evaluated under grazing and quite intense grass competition and cattle grazing. And it's through this work that after three and a half years, uh, the relish red clover plants were literally standouts for survival. I believe, if I can remember correctly the paper, it was about 60% of the original plants were still alive at three and a half years. And the very best commercial line was, I think, believe, between 18 and 20% of the total number of plants surviving. And out of the 100 or more accessions from all over the world, all of them were less than that. So it has been a real step change in persistence under grazing in grass pastures and persistence full stop. So uh, Relish has been a, a bit of a game changer for Agricom. Uh, we were really happy with the varieties we were dealing with before, but the resilience and the performance of this particular cultivar has been nothing but um, outstanding. All of these sort of genetics have also been developed, um, selecting for low photoestrogens, which is one of those uh, uh, interesting uh, plant. Uh, it's basically mimicking a human hormone or an animal hormone, um, but it's been created by a plant, so that's why it's called a photoestrogen. And this has been attributed to some of the reproductive issues uh Historically, back in the 70s particularly, they focused on this as one of the limitations to using red. Uh, But that's been a a targeted breeding uh, activity of reducing photoestrogens so that they are much, much lower than they were. And I I guess um, probably that the plant's producing that as some sort of um, defence mechanism probably. Um, And so um, what's probably been nice about the um, relish red clover is we've managed to get something that's lasting longer um, from a genetic point of view um, as well as um, lower um, phytoestrogen. So I guess... Which um, highlights it wasn't a direct link and there was other more significant traits, possibly change of root structure or or change of habit. Um, Yeah, so it's probably driven that. So I agree. I mean, I think this has been a, a, a real success for plant breeding in terms of being able to solve kind of the Achilles heel of red clover and that wasn't lasting long enough, but also uh, gain the benefits of having something that's um, very productive um, and may um, represent um, lower risk in terms of some of those um, phytoestrogens. And it's typically around uh, the um, reproductive um, performance of, of, um, of animals. Well, just out of interest, with that in mind, moving on to animals, uh, the animal performance uh, from Red, what you, you've done a, hu- a huge amount of work in this area um, from live weight gains, uh, looking at summer and allocation through to lactation feeding using lambs. Um, you know, can you take us through why this plant is so special from an animal performance perspective? Yeah, I guess um, you know, a lot of the work we've done uh, um, both in, um, in sheep and cattle um, 
in general, um, you'll see uh, an increase in terms of most of the um, productive parameters um, of animals when you start feeding um, large amounts of red clover or increasing amounts of red clover. And, and I guess there's a, there's a couple of reasons for that. And, and the first thing is, a, uh, is around intake. Um, for uh, clovers, what we've got is a plant that is easily harvested. We've got leaves in the um, horizontal plane, not the vertical, so we've got uh, uh, they're much easily um, harvested. And the material, because of the way it's uh, put together, breaks down very quickly in the animal's uh, rumen. So what we've got are these very fast passage rates. Uh, animals are returning to grazing far sooner, and we're finding an increase in terms of intake over the day. So in a lot of cases, um, red clover from a feed test point of view is no more higher quality um, than the resident ryegrass that's there. But the, the way the animals can uh, graze that for sheep, um, the preference towards those uh, species and the speed at which those animals process that feed through the, uh, for the, through the, um, uh, the gut uh, means that they eat more in a day. So typically when we're eating red clover, we have a higher intake of a high quality uh, forage and therefore we have some increases in animal performance. The other key part of this is the the um, protein level. So um, uh, we are, our resident ryegrasses may be at a much uh, lower um, concentration of nitrogen, for example, uh, the protein levels. Um, red clover typically brings its own, so it's fixing nitrogen. So it's it's not often that we find red clover being deficient in nitrogen. Sometimes when we haven't got nodulation or or uh, when they're quite young, we can run into that problem. But typically, red clover is very good for, uh, in terms of protein and quality of protein. So we're not we talk about crude protein. Um, uh, Red clover has good true protein and therefore a much higher supply of protein to the animal. Right, just to stop you there for a second, Glenn, because you just described a super plant for animals. Uh, but I would uh, just just warn everyone, uh, it's not that straightforward because the reality is it's still a stem-based plant. So all these nutritional benefits you've just been discussing are when it's in vegetative, leafy state. Yeah, true. Um, I guess um, that was going to be my other point is in terms of allocation, um, you know, as we increase the the amount that we allocate to animals, we get a, um, a, they are able to eat more and therefore um, uh, our production or animal performance goes up. But that is... As you say, when we've got very leafy vegetative material. The one thing about red clover is if we let this um, plant really stretch its legs and potentially get up to the top of the fence, which is red clover quite is quite able to do, we see the quality, the overall quality of that plant um, decline enormously and the the um some of those um stems of the uh, red clover plant when they get very mature you know they are very woody um and the quality of that is is, is poor so um and, and just to put that in perspective really poor so i can't emphasize enough um, it is the same for other legumes that are aerial stemmed. Uh, when those stems lignify and go off, you cannot expect their feed test to have high protein. Well, they'll have slightly higher protein than other plants that are not legumes. They'll have higher protein, but their quality and the levels of that protein will still be low. So I've seen, just to put it in perspective, I've seen feed tests with MEs below 9 and crude proteins around 12 uh, from red clover and other stem-based legumes. So just because the legume, uh, be very aware that once a uh, stem is lignified, that is not a high-quality plant part. It fits very well in a hay-type system, but hay is not a high-quality feed. It's a, it's not, it's not a finishing feed. It looks really impressive when you You've got red clover up to the fence line. It looks amazing. The reality is that's probably as poor a quality as a seeding ryegrass. Yeah. So, absolutely. so I think the 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 um the management around the volumes that you move into and the, and the ability to stop it throwing these big heavy stems by grazing is really. And important. I bring that up from a systems perspective because we're discussing a high quality plant that can be a milking plant, uh, can deliver live weight gain, uh, help. Velveting stags, it's a pretty impressive plant, and we'll discuss that in farm systems uh, usage later. But if you're trading a supplement, yes, you want the volume, and red will deliver the volume. Uh, there is no question you can hit six, seven ton uh, yields. But again, it's absolute a collapse of quality, and you move from 
uh, maintenance type feed from a from a finishing feed if you're harvesting at about 3,000 to 3,500 kilograms of dry matter maybe even four you might get away with when you're you're cutting silage with red in it however once you clock those five six seven ton uh, silage crops you are not dealing with a finishing silage you're dealing with a maintenance silage so it's really important just to be aware this is quite meaningful for the way you accumulate because red clover is a powerhouse and you can grow more with it, uh, but it comes at a cost of quality when you try to push those big yields. Yeah, if you were so, my rule of thumb is if you were silaging, if you can hide a beer box in your red clover crop, it's time to get the, the silage chopper in because you're now starting to get over some of those yields that we were talking about. Yeah. I guess the other thing, um, and, and when, when you mentioned to Red Clover to Farmers, um, uh, one of the first things that, that they start talking about is some of the animal health um, yeah. issues that are um, uh, associated with that. And, the, and there's probably two that stand out the most. Um, the first one is around bloat. And, and this is a non bloating this is not a non bloating species. So we do get, um, we can get um, uh, occasions of bloat. Uh, particularly in cattle around high um, red clover intake, but but in the past, um, you know, a lot of our dairies have had cow grass or red clover uh, in them, and so this is not a um, you can't do this. It's a yes, there is an increased risk, but with that increased risk, we get added added benefits in terms of um, you know peaks in milk and maintaining uh, peaks. So there's a real benefit in terms of having it there, but um, there is this uh, requirement to be aware that it it, it can can cause bloat. So the normal uh, bloat uh, mitigation options apply here. So it may be that you are using um, some uh, bloat oils either um, uh, to the animal itself or um, uh, into the water trough. Um, uh, maintaining that these, or making sure these animals are full, that we're not going from very high intakes to very low intakes. So there's some things you can do to mitigate their risk. But we've got to be aware that as we increase the amount of clover and particularly red clover in the sward, that that can, can be a risk. The other one, and we Talked a little bit about the um, the phytoestrogens and the effect it has on uh, the reproductive cycle. So, um, uh, yes. Um, we've been breeding for low levels in our genetics, but um, given some of the environment and uh, and year and um, the um, soil that goes into, we can actually get um, even the lowest cultivars to drift up in terms of their phytoestrogen. And what that's essentially doing is um, is mimicking estrogen in the animal, um, and therefore it tends to reduce fecundity of animals, not fertility. So fecundity is we would be expecting to get less multiples um, and maybe a few more dries, but particularly less multiples. Um, and therefore, the use of red clover through that mating period is probably not ideal. Now, I give a cav caveat to that. Um, if you have other options then it may be that if you are chasing the maximum lambing percentage, if you like, that you then may use other forages. But I think um, where red clover is doing its thing, where um, it is the best paddock on the farm, particularly maybe coming out of a, um, a dry summer into that autumn period, the I would say uh, getting um, ewes on a rising plane of nutrition with good protein levels is probably going to do more benefit than um, worrying too much about um, the um, passing uh, effect of some phytoestrogens, um, particularly if um, if it's the only green thing on your farm. I think um, increasing the, the the performance of the animals or the the, the um, rising plant nutrition is far more important than sticking them out on the dry hill um, and um, and running into a decrease in life. That's a much larger effect. Yeah, so that that um, that's exactly right, and we'll probably share a little bit of. Uh, experience in this space where we've used a lot of pure steins are in this in this particular role looking at uh, grazing hoggets and I've got a dodgy photo on my phone which uh, you know out of con context uh, you every now and then you do see udder development uh, in new lambs that are grazing on red clover in the autumn uh, we've attempted to track that all the way through to their reproductive outcomes but also there's been no distinctive um, 
scary messages that have come from those individuals. But don't be surprised if you're using this to finish ewe lambs and ewe lamb replacements that when you share them in the autumn that you may see some uh, mammary development which is associated with a photoestrogen scenario. Yeah, which, it doesn't mean that they have been yeah. impaired in any way specifically. Yeah, I remember one uh, particular bit of work where we actually raised um, some ewe lambs um, uh, uh, right through to their first mating and they didn't see anything apart from red clover that we did see some um, uh, um, uncommon uh, memory development on those, um, but we uh, were able to make those successfully and, and therefore we didn't see any long-term effects of that. The one warning I would give is um, that's probably not the same for male lambs. So if we are raising um, uh, male lambs that are going to go on to be um, stud rams, um, that there is a little bit of evidence that um, supplying um, high estrogen feeds for an extended period, particularly through puberty, uh, may actually impair the male. Um, and so it might be um, really... Uh, good to keep them away from those yeah. sorts of feeds. The risk profile is just that much higher because Absolutely. one ram has so much more influence than one you. Yeah. So um, uh, getting to the farm system, because I think this We've is probably... We've been touching on them all the way through yeah. because it's becoming quite obvious it's yeah. a very important species to New Zealand agriculture. So yeah. yeah, and so in terms of the farm system, um, let's let's talk a little bit now about um, how and how you would incorporate this into a farm system and get the best out of it. So I, I really want to talk about the system you put it into and then how actually... Um, you can use it to its best advantage in those in those um, in those systems. So, Jody, the way I would probably like to handle this is that uh, we focus on the real two two predominantly broad ways of using red clover as it stands today. But then I'd pretty be pretty keen to break it down by farm type and, and actually farm system inside. And so, what we're really discussing here is its use in a pasture mixture, yeah. and uh, all by itself, or as a primary driver to a, uh, what we describe as a pure legume uh, finishing scenario. So, if I if I start with the the pasture mixture, you know, you really do need to understand just how strong a contribution red clover can make to your farm, either with your personal experience or whether you're trying to push things on from where you already exist. And the key here is that it is an expensive addition to a pasture mix. And and the key to that is one of the histories associated with judgments about persistence is something I mentioned earlier about one seed, one plant. If you don't put enough seed in and you're trying to judge persistence but you don't have a lot of plants from the start, that's quite a big deal. So sowing rate of red clover in a pasture mix has quite a big influence on on one, how much you get there to start with and how much uh, it can add so so, yeah. to your pasture. So sometimes... But also your perception yeah. of how much is there later. Yeah, so sometimes we get farmers saying, well... Um, Red clover wasn't for me, you know, I, I threw a kilo in and I never saw it. Yeah. And I guess what you're saying is that kilo represents about half a kilo of white. Um, and actually what you're seeing might be an excellent result from the amount of seed that you put in to start with. Um, and that knowing that this doesn't spread, you know, it's a bit like frozen butter, doesn't spread, um, that that it's that the sowing rate to start with should actually set some expectations. Yeah, absolutely. And so, and again... It's worth doing the research. It's worth, you know, um, uh, understanding just how powerful because, you know, one of the things uh, with RED is that once you understand it a lot, you will see very clearly it is very much a driver of production, not a passenger. So when you start to look to invest in adding these extra legumes, which are an expensive part of a total pasture mix, you do have to really value the punch that they're going to give to your system. And as I say, you know, we've coined that phrase is that red clover is a driver to your pasture. It's not a passenger. And so when you're putting it in your mixtures, you know, um, three to four kilograms is economically a pretty good space. Really hitting three is still quite a small amount in total and you'd have to be quite aware that you're delivering all your seed at a good depth, you're getting a good establishment of that lower sowing rate. Four is starting to 
probably get into a happy place, uh, and I have quite a lot of faith in a, a set of genetics like Relish that four will deliver enough plants that will last, that, that will create a punch. Uh, but really, a happy place for red is about that five to six kilogram rate, and this is the true happy place. It, it often is beyond most people's budgets, uh, but this is really, if you're trying to use red clover as a driver p- to pasture production, and as we break it down into the different farm systems, you may see where the value comes from putting it in at that rate. But in general pastures, my recommendation sits, depending on your confidence of establishment technique, between three and four. Uh, and as you start to really value it, it's moving out of that four to five to six sort of range. And so um, uh, that's in the pasture mix. Correct. So um, talk, talk to me about um, the other uses of this, maybe as a sole stand or as a major component of a, of a pasture. Well, because red clo- during it's been pretty heavily used in the sheep and beef industry historically. Uh, sheep, sheep and beef farmers have always valued diversity in pastures. And uh, what has happened over time, and people lose sight of the big pictures of trends and, and happenings, but I've actually been lucky enough to experience and see it, is that during the economic downturns, cost cutting really does change behaviour and it doesn't take long for that behaviour to kick in to become normalised. And one of these traits is the belief structures that, for example, red clover doesn't last. So what you see very quickly is that people have lost that sort of institutional knowledge of what red clover is. And uh, pretty much the sheep and beef industry went through a pretty tough time in the 80s and we saw a decline in red clover usage there. But it also um, re, um, re- went through another pretty tight period in the 2000s and in that time a lot of red clover came out of pastures as well. And so what happens though is people lose sight of how productive red can be. And it was about the early 2000s, uh, early in my career that I was working with a few farmers about using undersowing red with um, with uh, um, in rape crops and then carrying the red on as almost a pure finishing crop for a couple of years afterwards. And after four or five years of watching uh, these sort of pastures go, we started to remember, uh, get first-hand personal experience with just how productive actual red clover can be. Yeah, I remember, I remember um, walking into a seed crop um, yeah. and, and just being blown away at how productive red clover by itself, you know, under its well, management well, it actually is. When you saw that seed crop, you got to keep remembering it, it requires a closing date. So before that closing date, there was probably three cuts of silage taken off it before you saw it as a seed crop. So red clover in its own right, I don't know, but I think I've seen up to about 18 tonnes of dry matter in a calendar year from a red clover by itself in the right conditions. Um, and, and I guess that on top of that, think about the amount of nitrogen that that's cycling. Yeah, so this providing is, opportunity. Yeah, absolutely. So, so um, yeah, so the point being is that uh, with the re sort of acknowledgement that uh, red clover is a powerhouse in its own right, uh, where I was doing more and more pure stand work and actually moving it out of the under sun under rape to actually become its own driver of a pure stand. It was about that time you started to do quite a bit of work uh, on the back of some of our early plantain work and those lactation trials that we were doing, focusing on uh, dry land lactation feeding. And uh, that's where the pure stand work you started coming in. And the fact that people would never have thought that you could actually put ewes and lambs on red clover in September, early September, and actually uh, carry using lambs from virtually set stocking. Yeah, that was a that was a surprise at how early we had um, good cover, particularly from um, you know uh, cultivars such as relish um, that we were able to drive, um, if not use, and, and we were able to do that. But certainly, if we were lambing hoggets, now a little bit later, um, we had some. Um, it was a very useful forage from from that point of view. Um, Great intake. We were driving milk production early and high in those ewes, and so a really useful, um, I guess, it's a really useful system. Maybe not for all ewes, um, uh, um, uh, single bearing, um, you know, mixed yeah, age ewes, overkill, <laughs> is a bit of overkill for them, but uh, particularly for hoggets or for light ewes, um, it's a really good system in terms of um, driving some of that. Some of that, and, um, and just getting back to exactly how powerful red can be in its own right is a. Uh, there's only a very few people I've ever seen being able to stock up high enough in November in those systems not to have to put cattle in across the top to clean up or or stocking rates of ewes and lambs at foot above 7 
17 per hectare um, that's used with multiples at foot. Um, by November, it's just blowing all the stocking rates out of the ground. Um, so it's pretty impressive. Yeah. And I guess the other part of this, and, and, and I guess this is what distinguishes it between other forage systems, is that... Um, with red clover, we can always put it into a bale. We can always conserve that. And so it gives a lot of flexibility around, um, you know, if I'm going to use it as a lambing feed, but it gets away on me, I can shut half the paddock up or a third of the paddock up, and I can take that for silage at the appropriate time. Um, and so that's a, it's a real flexibility. If we were doing that with, um, you know, uh, a brassica, for example, um, uh, then some of those things aren't quite as easy to wrap right. up. Um, I think it's called sauerkraut by the time you put it in <laughs> silage. Um, but yeah, it, it is very, it, it can be achieved, but it's nowhere near as, uh, you know, not as familiar yeah. and nowhere near as straightforward. So um, let, let's go through our farming systems yeah. and just and just touch where red clover fits. So in a, in so a dairy system? So we're discussing yep. the fact that, you know, we've got the two primary ways we use it, one in a pasture mix, and that pasture mix can be with any grasses, uh, any other species like red, uh, lucerne, red clover can work, um, uh, chicory, red clover. So it doesn't have to be just grasses, uh, but you've got it in mixtures and then you've got it as a, a driver of a legume-based system that may last between two and three years, depending on weed grass control and, and weeds. So in a, in a, in a dairy system, yep. for example, the obvious one is around um, putting it into your um, pasture mix. Is there anything else that you'd use that for? Yeah, well, see, this is the, this is the thing. is It's not as straightforward as that at all, actually, because the issue with the dairy pastures is rotation length. And uh, red clover does sit out outside your early spring and mid spring rotation lengths and that's where it can put pressure on using red clover effectively inside a dairy pasture I believe it's an element of the future but the reality is uh, you know it is in conflict to the rotation lengths that we have in the current dairy system so if you're pushing longer rotations red clover in a reducing nitrogen you know fertilizer uh, world that we're moving towards. Red clover is a bit of a powerhouse, but you must be on those longer rotations. And if it can survive through intensive grass springs and intensive grazing rotations anywhere under 20 days, to get to your summer rotations, which can quite often blow out beyond 30 days, uh, red clover can fit on a platform there. However, its happy place in a dairy system is the runoffs. And in the runoffs, it is a powerhouse of silage production. Uh, it can definitely support a lower nitrogen use on a runoff based system for silage because it's bringing its own nitrogen uh, supporting its own total dry matter production and volume uh, so it really is powering those uh, runoffs and it should be the two systems and in sheep and beef um, sheep and beef well general pasture it is that legume and sheep and beef rotations it must be able to tolerate a set stocking phase and that's where relishes uh, evolution under or uh, breeding under uh, intensive grazing and grass competition really fits and it does fit those set stocking phases but in a sheep and beef system you do roll out into bigger longer rotations and that's when red comes into its own uh, I, I do see it as a broadcast plant into uh, high rainfall hill country and hill country development definitely and that's the history of cowgrass which is red clover in that uh, landscape but really where it, where it excel, excels is in those strategic finishing environments where you may not to want to run multiple years of you know single brassica cropping you may want to have a paddock down for up to three years where it's delivering a cropping rotation for three years for finishing predominantly lambs and young stock and possibly putting weight on use prior to tupping. All right, well, I think uh, we've got it there. Um, I've got to go and check some cows. If you must. Yeah, I'd just like to summarise though before you do though, Glenn, uh, looking at it as a species, it's a, a really important uh, species to New Zealand agriculture, particularly now as nitrogen limits are implying another legume that is home in our pastures. And remember, it is... Uh, red clover is the driver, it's not the passenger, and the real key to this is remembering just how productive this plant can be and how many ways it can fit in. Its tolerance to clover root weevil uh, creates some resilience in environments where we can still clover, see clover root weevil sweep across the landscape. Uh, its ability to, uh, with the new genetics such as relish, survive under intensive grass pressure and grazing, fitting into the cropping systems and the pasture systems. We've already discussed the animal uh, traits of fast 
breakdown, uh, dry matter production. We uh, also leave this uh, podcast with the awareness that it can be mismanaged and it can be underwhelming quality if you let the stem build up too long. So um, hitting the targets for what you're wanting to achieve with it are important. And uh, we've become aware of some of those animal health issues. It can fit into a lot of systems which we haven't mentioned today, such as deer finishing, uh, sheep milk production. All of these systems are, are a place where red clover will have a very strong fit. So, Glenn, I think that probably summarises those key traits that we've discussed through this. Righto. Thanks, Al. See, See, you next, See you next time. See ya. To the extent permitted by law, Agricom Limited provides no assurance, excludes liability and limits any remaining liability to twice the amount received by it in relation to any information, product or service it supplied.